My name is Nicholas Donin. I am uh, Assistant Professor of Urology and Urologic Oncology uh, with uh, UCLA Health. Uh, and we are here today to talk about um, upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Okay, so upper tract urothelial carcinoma um, is a cancer of the lining of the urinary tract. Um, and it's a cancer that, it can, that can occur anywhere from uh, the uh, top of the kidneys all the way down through the bladder um, uh, and the urethra. Um, uh, and this um, uh, most commonly occurs in, bladder can uh, in the bladder, where it's known as bladder cancer. Um, but in rare cases, in about 10% of cases, it can occur in the upper urinary tract, in the kidneys or the ureters. And in those cases, it's called upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Um, first thing to know about upper tract urothelial carcinoma is it is a rare disease. It does not occur commonly. So this graph demonstrates uh, new diagnoses of cancer in 2018. So you can hear pros see here prostate, breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer. The bars are pretty high. They're commonly diagnosed cancers. You'll see over here upper tract urothelial carcinoma does not occur very commonly. And that makes it a little bit of a difficult disease to study because we do not have a lot of patients on, in whom to study. So what are the signs and symptoms of upper tract urothelial carcinoma? The most common sign or symptom of upper tract urothelial carcinoma is blood in the urine. And that's either blood that you can see with your eyes when you urinate or blood that your doctor may have detected uh, in a urine sample um, uh, when they were you know, checking you. Um, uh, other symptoms can be pain in the flank over the kidneys. That's in this region. Um, uh, and then in rare cases of more advanced disease, there can be pain in other parts of the body where the tumor has spread or weight loss. That would be in cases of pretty advanced disease. What are the risk factors of upper tract urothelial carcinoma? The number one risk factor is smoking, um, also a risk cancer for bladder cancer or urothelial carcinoma of the bladder. Um, exposure to certain types of chemicals, um, uh, particularly dyes or chemicals that you may be exposed to if you've worked for many years in, in a factory or exposed to those types of chemicals. Um, there are also some genetic disorders, particularly one called Lynch syndrome, uh, and those patients are at higher risk for urothelial carcinomas than an average person. Um, and there's a, there's a, a chemical called aristolochic acid, which is um, a part of some uh, Chinese herbs um, and uh, can predispose a person to upper tract urothelial carcinoma, and it also causes a disease known as Balkan nephropathy. So if your doctor is suspicious or concerned that you may have uh, upper tract urothelial carcinoma, the first step in diagnosis is generally some imaging. And that's usually either a CT scan or an MRI. This is a CT scan with a patient with upper tract urothelial carcinoma. You can see over here this kind of crescent-shaped organ. That's the kidney. This whitish area is the first part of the ureter, the first part of the drainage tube of the kidney. Generally, the white, the white is the contrast. The contrast should fill the entire renal pelvis here, this ureter. When it doesn't, we have something that's known as a filling defect. And what we're worried about is that potentially that represents a tumor. So if you have blood in your urine, you have a CT scan that has an image like this, your doctor will probably refer you for the next step in diagnosis. And the next step in diagnosis is typically ureteroscopy. What's ureteroscopy? Ureteroscopy is a procedure where the urologist will take a long flexible camera and will run it through your bladder and up your ureter, up all along your ureter, all the way up to the kidneys to look directly at the area that they may be concerned about. Um, Urothelial carcinomas have a very typical classic look. This is a picture of one. It has this sort of cauliflower appearance or it looks a little bit like a sea anemone. And if your urologist observes this and confirms that there is a tumor, the next thing he, uh, he or she will do is, will is, is to take a biopsy of this, to take a small piece of this tumor uh, and then give it to the pathologist. So when the pathologist gets the tumor, they'll look at it under the microscope and they'll make a diagnosis. They'll determine if it's urothelial carcinoma and then they'll determine the grade of the urothelial carcinoma. The grade is really a surrogate for the aggressiveness of it. And urothelial carcinoma really has two grades. There's low grade and there's high grade. So on the left we have a picture of low grade urothelial carcinoma. You can see that the cells are slightly disorganized but they generally have a somewhat orderly appearance. They're lined up. There's a fair amount of pink here, not a huge amount of blue. This is a low grade tumor. This is a high grade tumor. You can see here there's a lot more blue which are the nuclei. It's much more disordered. It's kind of angry looking. This is a high grade tumor. Low grade tumors are less aggressive. High grade tumors are more aggressive. Okay, so if you 
do have a diagnosis of upper tract urothelial carcinoma, the next question is what are the treatments? So the gold standard treatment for urothelial carcinoma for many, many years was a surgery called nephrourethectomy, and that means removal of the kidney and the ureter, this entire upper urinary tract on the affected side. Um, it is um, uh, the gold standard, was for many years the gold standard treatment. Um, there are also circumstances in which patients may have a tumor just in the end of the ureter, and in that case there may be the possibility of just removing the end of the ureter and then reconnecting it to the bladder, and that's called a ureterectomy. That's much less common. Uh, what are the benefits or advantages to having a nephro-ureterectomy or a ureterectomy? So it does provide the highest likelihood that the cancer is going to be cured. Um, it's a single surgical procedure. Um, it is uh, because the actual affected organ is removed and then will be uh, carefully examined by a pathologist, it allows the sort of most accurate appraisal of the uh, uh, extensive involvement um, of the tumor. Um, and it is the treatment of choice in patients who have high grade or aggressive disease. The most aggressive disease warrants the most aggressive treatment and this would be the most aggressive treatment. Uh, what are the disadvantages of nephroureterectomy? Well, it's a relatively substantial surgery. There's some recovery time involved, particularly for older patients. Um, uh, the other major issue to consider is that uh, the patient is losing their kidney and their ureter. And the loss of a kidney results in decreased renal function. We know that decreased renal function is associated with various adverse health outcomes. The other issue is if that patient in the future should require certain medications and particularly chemotherapy, after they have lost one of their kidneys, they may not be able to get that chemotherapy because they won't have enough remaining renal function. The other thing to consider is that if we're dealing with small, low-grade tumors, it simply may be more treatment than is necessary. We may be able to get rid of those small, low-grade tumors without having to remove the whole kidney and the ureter. So what about some of these alternative treatments for smaller, low-grade tumors? Well, one option is an ureteroscopic treatment. So just like your urologist put a camera up to biopsy the tumor, they could also put a camera up and potentially destroy the tumor. This is a video of a urologist who's treating an upper tract urothelial carcinoma with a laser, and that would be something called a laser ablation. They put a camera up in the ureter, they visualize the tumor, which has this sort of cauliflower appearance, and they use a laser to destroy it. The benefits are it's a relatively minor surgery, there's no removal of the kidney and ureter, so you keep your kidney and ureter, and it is a potentially reasonable treatment for tumors that are not aggressive or low grade and that are small. So again, the benefits, small surgery, minimal risk of surgical complications, and you get to keep your kidney. What, what are the disadvantages? Well, the disadvantages are you may not be able to remove the entire tumor all at once. So as you could see in that video, the visualization can be difficult, it can be challenging, it's hard to see, you're using a very small camera. So it may require, and it most likely will require, multiple treatments by your urologist. There will also have to be extensive and uh, close surveillance of that area because the whole area wasn't removed. Because we left the ureter in, we've got to keep a very close eye on it to make sure that the tumor doesn't come back. And so that involves multiple ureteroscopies and potentially multiple interventions. So it's a little bit more high maintenance from that standpoint. So you may ask the next question, what about medical therapy for urothelial carcinoma? Are there any medicines? And yes, there are medicines. And in fact, medical therapy or topical therapy applied directly to the tumor has been used for many, many years in bladder cancer. Why has it been used in bladder cancer? Well, the bladder is very easy to access and it's very easy to deliver medications into the bladder. So you see this, um, you see this uh, 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 figure here. Here is the bladder. Here is a catheter that's going into the bladder, and you can see this blue is the medication, and it directly contacts the tumor. So a catheter can be very easily inserted into the bladder, medicine can be delivered to the bladder, and then it directly contacts the tumor, and that medicine can stay in there for a prolonged amount of time. People can typically hold the medicine in their bladder for a couple hours. So there's a number of different medicines that have been used over the years for this, BCG, mitomycin, gemcitabine, valrubicin, those are all medicines that have been used in the bladder for topical therapy of urothelial carcinoma of the bladder. What about medical therapy for the upper tract, you may say? The 
problem with the upper tracks is they're very difficult to access and it's very difficult to achieve prolonged contact between medicine and tumor in the upper tract. And the reason is that the upper tract of, of the upper urinary tract is designed to rapidly drain things down into the bladder. That's what they do. So when your kidney produces urine, it rapidly drains that urine down into the bladder. So this is a picture of a urologist who squirted some urine, that's the white colored stuff, into the upper urinary tract and took a picture. 30 seconds later, you can see that, that medicine all drains out very, very rapidly. So while we can get the medicine up into the tract, it drains out very quickly and you can't achieve prolonged contact between the medicine and the tumors. Now this brings us to one of these new therapies that we're gonna talk about today. So we're gonna talk about a special kind of gel. It's a, very interesting, um, it's a very interesting material. The way it works, this gel works, is that when you freeze it, when you put it on ice, it becomes liquid. But when you warm it up to room temperature or body temperature, it actually becomes a gelatinous kind of solid. So it's actually kind of the reverse of what you would expect. It becomes gel when it's warm and it's liquid when it's cold. And so some, uh, some smart people came up with the idea of possibly putting the gel on ice, it becomes a liquid, squirting it into the upper urinary tract, it will reach the upper urinary tract, the body will warm it, it will gelatinize in the upper urinary tract, and then within the next several hours the urine will dissolve it and it will run out. So a lot of the preclinical, pre-human work for this was done here at UCLA, and these are some pictures of that work. So this is a CT scan. The gel is the white stuff here and here that you can see. And in this case, the gel was instilled into the kidneys, and a CT scan was done. And we see the gel there immediately after it was put in. And then five hours later, another CT scan here shows that there's still gel within the upper urinary tract. So we're getting contact between the gel and the upper urinary tract for about five hours, which is a huge improvement over the 30 seconds that I showed you in the other, in the other slide. This is a very similar thing. Instead of CT scan, this is x-ray, and you can see this is before the gel is squirted. On, the, on these pictures, the gel is the dark color, so you can see gel here and gel here inside the kidneys, and you can see that there's still a little bit of gel left at four hours. So this gel looks like it may give us the possibility of delivering topical medicine to the upper urinary tract and achieving prolonged contact time. So they began to investigate this in humans. They started in the bladder. This is a couple pictures from the bladder. This is a tumor in a patient's bladder. The patient had treatment with the gel just into the bladder. And we see that after a number of treatments, the tumor has actually been gone, uh, has actually been, been destroyed by, by the, the effect of the gel. Here's another picture in the bladder of a small little tumor that was treated with the gel. So these are very preliminary studies that gave us some sense that maybe this could work. Here's an example of a tumor in the upper urinary tract. So this is the ureteroscopic view. This is the urologist put a camera into the ureter, saw this tumor here. This is a picture, a dye picture of the same thing. This, this filling defect again here is a picture of the tumor. The patient underwent a number of different gel treatments. And then this is the picture from the ureteroscope after the patient had the gel treatments. The gel actually uh, had the ability to destroy that tumor within the ureter. So these were very early kind of investigations using this gel, and based on some pretty interesting results, uh, there's now a trial that's going on. The name of the trial is the Olympus trial, and it's using this gel for patients who have low-grade upper tract urothelial carcinoma. So it's only for patients who have low-grade disease. Right now, we think that high-grade disease is still too aggressive, and those patients should have their, or you know, the nephroureterectomy have things removed. Um, uh, uh, so the way it works is patients who have uh, low-grade upper tract disease undergo six treatments with the gel. Uh, after their treatments, they undergo surveillance with ureteroscopy where the urologists look back up in the ureter to make sure the tumor is gone. And the study is currently ongoing. We don't have the final results. But earlier this year, they did release some interim results, and the interim results looked pretty good. So there were 28 patients for whom they were able to provide some information during this interim analysis. All of the patients obviously had low-grade disease because only low-grade disease was evaluated in the trial. And 16 of the 28 patients, or 57% of the patients, had no tumor that was visible when they had their follow-up you know, camera examination, their ureteroscopy. So that was a 57% uh, rate of response. So that was very encouraging. A second set of patients who'd been followed for a little bit longer had another ureteroscopy done at three months. And of all of those six patients who had the three-month follow-up, uh, none of them had any detectable cancer. So it was very, very sort of initial results um, that are, you know, that are exciting for, for us. Um, 
So just to summarize this sort of novel treatment, um, it's a gel. It uses mitomycin, which is one of the medicines that's used for bladder cancer. Um, and it's being used for upper tract, low-grade tumors. Um, it may be able to actually destroy these tumors without the need for surgery or ablation. Um, uh, it may be able to increase the number of patients who don't have to have surgery for their upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Very important to remember, the results are not complete yet. This is an ongoing trial. We don't know yet if it is going to ultimately uh, pan out to be a safe and successful treatment, but the early results are reasonably encouraging. Um, if the results look great, this could end up being a product that is FDA approved and that we can use in the future. So it's interesting, it's preliminary, but it's interesting. So I wanna switch gears now. We talked about a new treatment for low-grade disease. Now I wanna talk about new, not necessarily treatments, but treatment paradigms for high-grade disease. So again, we said earlier that the standard of care, the standard treatment for anybody with a high-grade or an aggressive disease is a nephrourethectomy, a removal of the kidney and the ureter. Um, despite that type of major surgical intervention, there are a substantial number of patients who will ultimately, even if they have surgery, the disease will show up somewhere else in their body. It will show up in the lungs, it will show up in the liver, show up in the lymph nodes. And those patients who have developed with basically a systemic disease need a systemic treatment with either chemotherapy or immunotherapy. Despite that, once the disease has become systemic, typically chemotherapy and immunotherapy don't cure the patient. They can prolong life, but they don't cure the patient, and the majority of those patients who have metastatic disease will ultimately die of their disease. So we, we, we have a lot to work on for high-grade disease. So people have asked the question, in cases of this high-grade disease, should we add chemotherapy on top of surgery? Should we combine chemotherapy and surgery for these aggressive disease uh, cases? Uh, does it improve overall survival? Well, we know the same, that this exact question has been asked in bladder cancer, and we know that it does improve survival in bladder cancer. So we know that for invasive disease, aggressive disease of the bladder, if you give chemotherapy before bladder surgery, it improves survival, and we have very good evidence that if you give chemotherapy after surgery for bladder cancer, that it also improves survival. So if we know that chemotherapy plus surgery improves survival in bladder cancer, could the same thing be true for urothelial carcinoma of the upper urinary tract? That's the question we want to address. Well, fortunately, there was a trial that recently published its results that sought to answer that exact question. So it's called the POUT trial, and the question it wanted to answer was, does chemotherapy after nephrourethectomy prevent disease recurrence in patients with high-grade or aggressive urothelial carcinoma of the upper urinary tract? It was a randomized prospective trial. That's the, that's the highest, uh, the best kind of uh, 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 clinical trial that there is. Um, it was done in the UK at 57 different centers, um, and it enrolled patients who had undergone nephrourethectomy, who were found to have invasive disease or aggressive disease at nephrourethectomy, and it randomized them. So half of the patients got simple observation after their surgery, and up till this trial, that was the standard. You had surgery, and we waited. The other half had surgery, and then as soon as they'd recovered from their surgery, they were given four cycles of chemotherapy. Even if we didn't know if the tumor had spread or not, we just said this pa these patients have high-grade disease, it's, a it's invasive disease, we're gonna give you chemotherapy after your surgery. And they got four cy cycles of something called gemcitabine, and then either cisplatin or carboplatin. We'll talk a little bit about these later. So this is a summary. The POUT trial, it ran from 2012 to 2018. It enrolled 248 patients. As I said, there was two arms. There was the observation arm. So half the patients got observation. Half the patients got chemo. They followed the patients um, uh, for you know, approximately 17 and a half months. That was the median follow-up. Patients were approximately 69 years old. About a third of the patients had what was called T2, so invasion of the muscular layers of the ureter, and uh, two-thirds of the patients had uh, T3 disease, which is invasion throughout the, throughout the um, uh, muscle layer of the ureter all the way through. That's a fairly typical cohort. That's pretty classic of people who need to get nephrourethectomy for high-grade disease. What they found was that chemotherapy, if you got chemotherapy after surgery, it reduced the likelihood that your disease came back by about 53%. So that, in statistical language, that, that, that's described as a hazard ratio of 0.47 in favor of chemotherapy. 
they found that at two years, 70% of the people who got chemotherapy had no disease, whereas only 51% of the people who did not get chemotherapy were free of disease. So this was a very important finding. Chemotherapy helped prevent the disease from coming back. It's important to understand that that benefit came at a cost. There were more adverse events uh, in patients getting chemotherapy than in patients who did not get chemotherapy, and that's pretty predictable. You'd expect that. Um, the other thing to important the important thing to understand about this trial is that what they were looking at or what they've published so far is disease-free survival, meaning freedom of the disease from coming back. We don't yet know if it actually prolonged these patients' lives. That's termed overall survival. The trial does not, has not been going for long enough for us to know if chemotherapy prolongs overall survival. And overall survival is the gold standard for cancer outcomes. We want to know if what we're doing makes patients live longer. We don't know that yet. So, but I would say that this data is very suggestive that chemotherapy after nephrourethectomy um, uh, is beneficial for patients. So you may ask, why wouldn't somebody get chemotherapy after surgery? You just told me about the PAUT trial. It prevented disease recurrence. Why wouldn't I get it? Well, one reason you might not be able to get chemotherapy is if you have poor renal function. Well, why might somebody have poor renal function after a nephrourethectomy? It's pretty simple. They just had one of their kidneys taken out. So this is a diagram. This is a, a, a very simple diagram. Before nephrourethectomy, two kidneys. After nephrourethectomy, one kidney. So loss of a kidney leads to decrease in renal function. That's both intuitively understandable, but it's also been proven in a number of different studies. There's a lot of different studies showing this. I just kind of picked two, which are referenced down here, but some people have estimated that global kidney function goes down about 24% after nephrourethectomy. Some other urologists has, um, um, uh, have looked at, uh, so, so this is critical because one of the key chemotherapies is called cisplatin, and you have to have a filtration number of about 50. That's a ballpark figure. But you have to have a filtration number of about 50 to get cisplatin. So some urologists estimated that in one of their groups, they looked at the patients before nephrourethectomy, about 80% of them would have been candidates for the cisplatin. They could get cisplatin before nephrourethectomy. That dropped to about 50%, 55% after the kidney was removed. In a different group of patients, about 48% of them could have gotten cisplatin before nephrourethectomy, and that dropped to about 22% after nephew. So it's critical, critical, critical that your urologist considers your renal function as part of a sort of global management strategy when we're talking about high-grade upper tract disease. So it raises the question, who should get chemotherapy prior to nephrourethectomy? Might there be a benefit to doing chemotherapy before nephrourethectomy? Well, if a patient who is, uh, appears to have an ag aggressive disease based on imaging and based on biopsy, so that's the first criteria, that's a patient you're considering nephrourethectomy for, and has sufficient renal function before surgery to get the cisplatin chemotherapy, but you are concerned that after surgery they might not be able to get cisplatin chemotherapy, that is a person who you really want to strongly, strongly, strongly consider giving the chemotherapy before surgery. And that is increasingly being recognized by more and more people that it is critical to think both about surgery and chemo and the sequencing of those things. Are there any studies of giving chemotherapy before nephrourethectomy? We talked about the PAUT trial. That was nephrourethectomy followed by chemo. What about studies of chemo before nephrourethectomy? There are no published randomized studies yet, but there are some in the works. There are a number of different studies. I've just picked out three of them off clinicaltrials.gov that you can see here, but this is an area of active investigation. So this is just a kind of summary slide about what we talked about today. Um, there are exciting developments in, in a multitude of different areas of upper tract urothelial carcinoma. For low-grade disease, we talked about this new therapeutic gel that has these reverse thermal gelation properties. Um, it's a, a potentially a, a, a appropriate treatment for patients with low-grade disease. Uh, there is a trial ongoing that's published some relatively encouraging interim results, but we're still waiting for the long-term results uh, of that trial. If the gel looks good, if the, if the side effects are uh, acceptable and the treatment efficacy is good, 
it could potentially lead to an FDA approval of this new agent, so that could be exciting for patients with low-risk disease. In high-grade disease, high-risk disease, we talked about the POUT trial. It proved that giving chemotherapy after surgery prolongs disease-free survival. We don't yet know if it prolongs overall survival. Uh, we have to wait uh, for the, the final results to be published. Um, and it also suggests that in a lot of patients, we should really be considering giving that chemo preoperatively so that they can receive it, because many patients after nephrouridectomy will not be able to get chemotherapy. Uh, so we're going to take some time now to answer some questions from the audience. Okay. So, okay, the first question is, thank you very much for the questions, by the way, is this the same as renal cell carcinoma? And it's actually not. So renal, so the kidney really has two parts. It has a solid part um, uh, that where the actual kidney does the actual filtering. And tumors that start from that solid part of the kidney, those are renal cell carcinomas. They have a very different biology than upper tract urothelial carcinoma. They're treated very differently. Um, uh, the upper tract urothelial carcinomas that we were talking about today are tumors of the lining of the kidney. They can occur within the kidney, but it's still the lining. It's not the solid part of the kidney. So very good question. They are different, uh, they are different entities. Um, a prevention of upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Well, the number one thing you can do to prevent it is to not smoke, or if you are smoking, to stop smoking. We know that stopping smoking decreases your risk uh, for, for virtually every type of cancer um, uh, and has a multitude of other health benefits. So if you are smoking, stop smoking. Talk to your primary care doctor about ways to stop smoking. There, there are some new developments in smoking cessation, critically, critically important for all areas of health. Um, uh, those are really the, that's really the mainstay of preventing upper tract urothelial carcinoma. Um, so the next question is, how do I know if I'm a candidate for chemotherapy? Well, that will depend on a lot of different things. You'll have to talk to your urologist to find out whether or not the type of upper tract urothelial carcinoma you have would warrant a consideration of chemotherapy. And then if it does, whether or not you're a candidate based on your renal function, based on your performance status, some other things that urologists think about when they think about um, giving chemotherapy and, and, what, and, and not only urologists, but medical oncologists as well. Uh, and the next question is, how can I talk to my urologist about treatment with the gel? Well, the gel right now is not available um, outside of the clinical trial, the Olympus clinical trial, and the trial actually is not accepting any more patients. So for right now, we're all going to have to kind of wait and see how the trial uh, turns out, to wait and see how the outcomes are um, for the patients who are enrolled in the trial. So the gel is, is not available um, for upper tract carcinoma um, outside of the trial. Um, so uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and um, uh, thank you for your questions and thank you for your attention.